right, using a table of signs. A technique that seems to be missing from schools these days. Using it in three cases. First of all, to find the nature of the stationary points on a power four curve. Secondly, to sketch or get a picture at least of the graph of a rational function. And lastly, to solve an, an equation. Well, first of all, finding the stationary points on a power four curve. I'll put that back down again. Now it's x to the 4, so the first term before x cubed. I haven't specified it because I'm just going to go straight in with the derivative. Let's say there was a common factor that came out, something like a 2. So I've got something like this, for instance, for the factors that would result from that. And then the next point would be, well, any stationary points will occur when the derivative is 0. The rate of change, the gradient of the graph, which means that that factorised expression should equal zero. And that's easy enough because they're all factorised, so any one of those could be the culprit for making it equal to zero. So I've got x equals negative a half, x equals three, and x equals negative two, as, ooh, can't get hold of this, the possible solutions to it. Then the next part would be, what happens at each of those points? Well, I don't need to then go through this original expression, whatever it was, this original expression here, putting all the values in to see where it comes to numerically. All that matters is what happens before and what happens after each of those. And for that, a table of signs can be used. Now, normally you'd put it over here, but I'm just going to set it down here. So, for the potential values of x, the next thing is this. It's only a polynomial function in 4. It's a well-behaved function. It doesn't have any little asymptotes or any cusps from joining functions together. It's a smoothly differentiable curve. So I don't need to consider the neighbourhoods. I just need to consider what happens before and after each of them. Something happens at negative 2, something happens at negative 1.5, and something happens at 3. And whatever was happening before negative 2 will continue happening forever. However it's going when it leaves negative 2, it'll be doing the same thing when it arrives at negative 1.5. So I don't need to consider the neighbourhoods in this case because it's a well-behaved, smooth, differentiable function. And the same here, and the same above it. Now, what I'm not going to do is pick a number, some number before negative 2, something like negative 3, and then go through all this, working out the answer, oh, what does that come to? Does that come to positive 15.9? Oh no, is it 60? It doesn't really matter. It's just, is it positive or negative? And for that, these factors will tell me the answer. Now that 2 is always positive, so this won't influence the sign of the results. If that had been a negative 2, I'd have to take account of that and just rattle a negative through it. Using the table of signs simply means this. I consider each of these factors in turn 2x plus 1, x minus 3, and x plus 2. I consider what sign they'll have, and then the product of those will tell me the sign of the final answer, which is the sign of the derivative. The other thing is, I don't need to put zeros down here. I know that at 2, the answer is going to be 0. At a half, the answer is going to be 0. And at 3, the answer is going to be 0. It's what happens between them that matters. And then it's just a case of putting the signs in. But you can run them along the way. It's a very simple linear pattern. That's a linear function. That function is going to increase. So it's going to be negative, and then at some point it'll be positive. And it'll always be negative until it hits 0, and then it'll be positive. So that's 0 at negative a half. Before it, it's going to be negative. After it, it's going to be positive. x minus 3. x minus 3 is 0 but 3. If I pick a number less than that, then the answer is going to be negative. And I pick a number bigger than it, it's going to be positive. But it's obvious from the nature of the graph of x minus 3. That's a graph that's going up the way. It's going to go up until it hits 3 when it's 0, then it'll be positive. x plus 2. That's going to hit 0 at negative 2. It'll be negative before it, it'll be positive after it. I've done no calculations at all with any numbers. It's just what's the value of the signs of each of these factors that make up the final product. So to get the sign, not the actual values, just the sign of the derivative, you just multiply these together. Negative something times negative something times negative something is still negative. Two negatives will cancel out, making that positive. A single negative, negative. Three negatives, positive. 
and from that I can see the shape of the curve. Going down, going along, going up. No surprise really, because it was a power 4 curve. You don't even really need a table of signs because it's obvious from a power 4 curve that it's going to have this shape. Unless the first term's negative, in which case it'll be upside down. Or unless you've got any double roots, in which case two of these points may flatten out and then make a point of inflection. But barring that, given that you have to show how you've derived them using a table, a table of signs is the simplest way to do it. There's no scope for arithmetical error in calculating anything. You simply put down the factors that are involved. If it was an expression that didn't factorise, that'd be different. If it was some expression and I couldn't get a factorisation because it's only with factors that you can get the signs, then yes, I would have to do it numerically, but not in this case. So for the second one, using a table of signs to find when this function, the graph of this function is positive and when it's negative, to get a picture of when it's above and below the axis. Not only that, yeah, well, the table of signs will also tell you how it will approach these vertical asymptotes with having to do a separate little calculation. So first bit, put it copied down. If possible, factorise it. So this is going to factorise into, so I've got x times x, it'll be a 3 and a 4, and it'll be a plus 3 minus a 4. Bottom's the difference of two squares, so if we get x minus 1, x plus 1. Right, what's that going to look at? If I was sketching that, if I was wanting the graph of it, when is it above, when is it below? When is y positive, when is it negative? When is this positive, when is this negative? A table of signs will tell me. Just put down all the different values you've got there. I've got a negative 3, a positive 4, a positive 1 and a negative 1. Right, put them in order. So for my x's, I've got a negative 3, a negative 1, a positive 1 and a 4. List all the factors that are going to make up this quotient. So I've got an x plus 3, an x minus 4, an x minus 1, an x plus 1. They're all nice linear functions. They're going to climb steadily through their values. They'll be negative because they're all positive x's until they reach zero and then they'll be positive. And then the final part would be the sign of y. Next part's this. I don't need to work it out to these particular ones because something's going to happen at each of those. I just want to know what happens between them. So that when x is negative three, the answer will be zero. When x is positive four, the answer will be zero. A bit messier, when x is one, the bottom's going to be divided by zero, so strictly speaking, I should say it's not defined. But since I'm considering the graph, I know that the graph of not defined means it shoots off to infinity. So I'm just going to be a bit naughty and put infinity there. Same here. x minus one, strictly speaking, at x minus one, I'm dividing by zero, so the value is not defined. Yes, the value's not defined, but I know the graph's going to shoot off to infinity. These will be two vertical asymptotes. I also know that I'll need to know how it approaches them, but the table will show me what's happening before it gets there, what's happening when it leaves it, and then get a, a sketch of it. You can rattle through the signs. X plus 3. X plus 3 is 0 at negative 3, so it's going to be negative before it and positive after it. X minus 4 will be 0 at 4, so it's going to climb up to 4 being negative, and then go positive afterwards. X minus 1 is going to be 0 at 1, so it's going to be negative before it, and then positive after it. x plus 1 is going to be 0 at negative 1, so it's going to be negative before it and positive after it. And then it's just a case of rattling through 4 multiplying negatives, positive. 3 multiplying negatives, negative. 2 multiplying negatives, positive. Only the 1, negative. All positive. That's the values of y, the signs of y, between each of these significant points in the graph. So if I wanted a quick picture of the graph, it would be like this. At negative 1, that's a vertical asymptote. At 1, that's a vertical asymptote. At negative 3, that's a 0. At 4, that's a 0. And then what happens before and after? Well, it was positive before it, it's negative after it, and it heads down to infinity. So that's how it approaches this asymptote. So it's going to come down like this. I shouldn't really make that go up because I can see from the graph it's going to tail off because I've got the same power above and below. So that's going to have a horizontal asymptote at value 1. That's going to be a bit over it. What happens between them? 
Well, it's positive. So it must have come down from infinity and then going back up to it. So the second part's going to be like there. So there must be some turning point in between. Then after that, it's a leaving that negative. So it must be negative after one of that discontinuity. So that's going to come up, go through a zero and then level off. A table of signs gave me all of that of the picture. The only thing the table of signs didn't give me was that horizontal asymptote and that turning point.